Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, there's very little time allotted to all the speakers, so I'm going to get right to the point. Um, we likely have a looming health problem on our hands with radio frequency radiation. Um, it's called RF, and it's emitted from all wireless technologies. This includes both consumer products and infrastructure issues, everything from cell and cordless phones, cell towers, Wi-Fi internet, wireless computer systems in schools and homes, WiMAX, uh, radio frequency ID tags, and a host of other high-tech products. The continuing unfettered use of this kind of radiation needs much closer scrutiny. People assume that these technologies are safe, but at the federal level there is almost no government research today, and most of the regulatory agencies have had their programs completely eviscerated. A whole um, area of important expertise is being lost just when we need it most. Almost all of the research on RF is now coming from Europe, and it's coming from Asia. We're falling far behind. No one is protected in the U.S. today from long-term, low-level exposures to RF, which is what we mostly experience. It's called electrosmog, and it's a form of energetic air pollution. One study in Europe a few years back found that the background RF in urban areas had increased by a factor of over 3,000 percent in just a 10-year period. Cell technology likely accounts for the rise that they, uh, that they uh, measured. U.S. cities are thought to be comparable, if not higher. That, uh, by anyone's reckoning, is an altered environment. We're essentially experimenting on people without their consent. Um, there are uh, exposure standards in place, but they are controversial and they're obsolete. Debate on this, by the way, is uh, not new. It goes all the way back to World War II, when the Euro U.S. Bureau of Shirps Ships first noticed that midshipmen developed cataracts and infertility problems near radar units. The heart of the debate is over what are called thermal versus non-thermal effects. The electromagnetic spectrum, I'm going to do a crash course in bioelectromagnetics here, um, is traditionally divided into ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation, which you're all familiar with, includes solar rays, x-rays, nuclear activities, things like that. It's known to have enough power to knock electrons off of cellular orbits and thereby cause genetic mutations. Um, those exposures, by the way, are uh, known to be cumulative over a lifetime. But non-ionizing radiation, which includes everything from the visible light frequencies all the way down to the Earth's natural electromagnetic fields, are thought not to have enough power to, uh, to, to do that. The non-ionizing bands have been deemed safe if they are kept under certain thresholds for tissue heating and electric shock. But that safety premise is false. Non-ionizing radiation can cause a host of biological effects below those thresholds. No one disputes thermal effects. Radiofrequency radiation can and does heat tissue, just like a microwave oven. The only debate is over whether there are adverse uh, non-thermal effects. What are they, and can they be reversed? The human anatomy, think about it for a minute, is an electrical organism. The heartbeat is electrical, brain waves are electrical, critical stages of cell division itself are electrically influenced. There's not much that happens in the human body that isn't electrical in one way or another. But the distinctions between forms of radiation may be more for the precision of the physics community than for the accuracy of biology models. Researchers are finding more, uh, more and more multisystemic effects at lower intensities all the time. And these non-ionizing uh, exposures appear to be cumulative as well. There may, in fact, be no safe threshold for low-level non-ionizing radiation, just like the National Academy of, Sci of Sciences has said that there is no safe threshold for ionizing radiation. They issued a, a study last year that found that. The only difference may lie in, in uh, specific exposure parameters that are not yet understood. The work of doctors Henry Lai and N.P. Singh at the University of Washington in Seattle definitely points in that direction. Those researchers found both double and single strand DNA breaks with low level microwave exposures below heating thresholds. According to traditional theory, that is not supposed to be happening. Their work has been replicated in about 12 different studies now. All wireless devices need base stations to bounce signals. That's how it works. Concerns over the infrastructure that's needed to support all of this technology started at the federal level with the Telecommunications Act of 1996. That bill unleashed not only a whole, uh, 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 the whole wireless juggernaut that we um, appear to love so much, uh, but it also uh, created a kind of rolling nightmare for homeowners and local uh, zoning commissions. Section 704 was written by lobbyists for the telecom industry, unfortunately. It was among, uh, in fact, the, one of the most destructive pieces of legislation as a journalist that I've seen in my career. That clause literally eviscerated the reason we have zoning in the first place. All state statutes identify the purpose of zoning as the responsibility to protect the health, safety, and welfare of a community. But the industry knew that without taking the health piece off the table, this build-out could never occur. 
They knew that once local officials look at the science, they do not approve towers near residences or schools, period. The placement of towers is a very contentious issue at the local level. I'm sure that every congressional uh, office has uh, heard from constituents about it. Property devaluation and health concerns are always at the top of the list. Few people realize that key questions about the safety of radio frequency radiation have never been settled. Despite what anyone says, no safe level of RF has ever really been determined. Unfortunately, there is a growing segment of the population that has become hypersensitive to these exposures. People report sleeplessness, hypervigilance, rashes, concentration problems, headaches, and a range of other symptoms. People do not even have an agency, agency to report symptoms to. In fact, most doctors do not know that these exposures should be considered as environmental factors. Low-level ambient RF is now associated with some of the fastest rising complaints in doctors' offices. Um, including headaches and sleep disorders, asthma and allergies, autism, and a host of deadly neurotransmitter diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. There is a big disconnect with doctors when it comes to this because most of the information is contained in biophysics journals, not um, a place where MDs typically read. What are we doing to ourselves? And more specifically, what are we doing to other species too? RF, even at extremely low intensities, is a known active genotoxin, meaning that it can and does damage DNA and that of other species as well. We should not fool ourselves. This is not an environmental freebie. Within the last 10 years, we have completely altered the electromagnetic signature at the Earth's surface with power densities and signaling characteristics that simply do not exist in nature. And this is all done with a presumption of safety that should not be made. We may already be seeing the law of unintended consequences with other uh, applications of this. Species extinctions have accelerated to a rate never seen before. There are studies that find that wildlife abandons areas when cell towers go in. There are plausible theories that say that ambient RF may play, play a, a role in a whole colony collapse of honeybees. That's a big one these days. Low-level electromagnetic fields are known to throw bees off of their uh, natural course, navigational course. One health po policy analyst that I worked with recently recognized immediately that with the big ticket illnesses like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, and brain tumors associated with low level RF, that wireless technology may have the ability to actually sync the healthcare system. Back in 1975, uh, long before computers and cell phones and Wi Fi, um, a Dr. William, uh, Dr. William Bice found severe alterations in human electroencephalograms at RF power levels that are now common in most urban areas. It was a small study using 10 human test subjects, but over a year's period of time, at extremely low power levels, Bice documented the entrainment of test subjects' brain waves with the microwave bands. Reactions entailed radical changes in mood and behavior, including rage reactions. Think of that the next time that somebody flips out on an airplane or uh, shoots up a school. Think, uh, think of, uh, of that entrainment. Um, most of the uh, newer technologies are functioning specifically in those wave bands. There are indications that some frequencies may be unsafe at any intensity. Exposures to electromagnetic fields have been found to interact with every system of the body. This is an important point when someone argues that turning down the power is all that's required. At power densities comparable to living within a thousand feet of a cell tower, studies now show impaired fertility, numerous cancers, links with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, immune system suppression, increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier, serotonin and melatonin suppression, and increases in free radical production. None of this is something that you want. Um, and none of this uh, research that I just uh, mentioned is uh, currently included in the FCC standards, which officially take no work after 1986 into consideration. And no regulatory agency is collecting information on what these technologies may be doing to people. There's no post-surveillance uh, activity by any of the agencies. Collecting hazards data should not be left up to private entrepreneurs with an eye toward class action litigation, as is now the case. There needs to be immediate government oversight. Senator Leahy also had a very good bill a few years back that called for the removal of Section 704. Hopefully that bill will be resurrected as it goes right to the heart of the matter regarding states' rights and citizen protection. In the meantime, there is an RF uh, interagency work group with representatives from FCC, EPA, FDA, OSHA, uh, NTIA, NIOSH, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, they uh, said that the FCC standards are decimetry-based, not biologically-based. That's an important point. 
That means that the standards are written more for um, how to make the systems work than for the biology uh, systems in its path. That's you and me and every other living thing. But as the professionals who help write the legislation, you have an ethical obligation to get this one right. Constituents back home are really relying on you, as are the regulatory agencies. And I thank you.